this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I told the confirmation students that we would be singing from the choir loft, I didn't specify which one, so thanks for moving on down here, folks. Um, today is an exciting day. We have a baptism this morning of Patty Jean, and I see, Patty, that you brought some of your friends with you today. Welcome. So glad you are here. And we will be celebrating Holy Communion as part of our service today, and would like to have all of our visitors know that at, at um, St. John's here, we believe that the Lord's table is open for all of you who trust in the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can come forward for either the elements of communion or you can um, have a blessing. So I just wanted you to know that you, you are welcome in that regard. Um, we also, um, Maria is back from, there she is, Maria is back from seminary and she will be delivering the message today. Thank you, Maria. Um, I want you to be sure to look at your announcement sheets because there are a lot of things that are, are happening coming up. Um, for instance, next week, a couple things will be happening. First of all, it is the culmination, the celebration of our stewardship event for this fall. And so we will be having a potluck. So be sure that you note that potluck um, in your calendar and, and come next week for that. Also, a, a sneak preview here is that um, during worship, we will be welcoming the new counselors for our Crossroads Counseling Center. And so we'll get to meet them and, and pray them into um, uh, their new position here. And so be sure to be here next week for those two events. Also looking ahead, um, there will be a citywide ecumenical Thanksgiving Eve service the day before Thanksgiving at 7 o'clock. It will be held this year. It rotates around. This year it will be held right down the street um, at First Presbyterian. And I've been asked to, to uh, preach the sermon that night. And so I invite all of you to come to that. Also, please note that on November 27th, and be sure to write this in your calendars, that um, we will be having a concert here. Roy Carroll from Warford Seminary will be our leader in that concert, um, which will include organ and songs and instruments and readings and prayers. I think it will be a really good event, so mark that 2 o'clock on November 27th. Um, like I say, there, there are other announcements in there that you want to uh, to look at, but what I want to do is, where's, there's Karen, okay? What I want to do is introduce Karen Goy. Um, she has the My name is Karen Goy, and I have been blessed to belong to the family St. John's since I've been five, and I won't tell you how many years that adds up to. Away from here, I spend much of my time working as a speech-language therapist, and I realize that I have become passionate about words and the power that they hold. The words that we hear, the words that we think, the words we believe, the words we speak, and most importantly, the words that we live are seeds that carry power, not only for ourselves, but for those that hear and receive them. They carry the power to encourage, affirm, strengthen, give life, instill hope, change perspectives and hearts, the power to calm, to heal, to welcome and include, to help others know their giftedness, value, purpose, to carry joy, but they also can carry the power to cause doubt or instill fear, to focus on lack, to cause hurt or illness, the power to steal joy and hope, the power to alienate or divide, the power to kill, if not in body, in dreams and spirit. Think about the words that you find yourself surrounded by every day. Words that you read, the words that you hear from others, the words going around in your own head, words people around you live in their actions or their inactions. We are bombarded daily by words that could suck the life and the joy and the energy right out of us if we let them. 
words that speak that we're not enough, pretty enough, smart enough, doing enough, popular enough, words that don't communicate truth. But here, in this place, it's different. God calls us here to be reminded of his words and the word, to be recalibrated and reminded and re-equipped so that we might become his life-giving voice, not just in here, but out there. I find myself drawn here every week to quiet those negative voices and to listen not only with my ears, but my eyes to the life-giving words that are spoken and lived here as I choose not just to worship, but more importantly, to fellowship and to serve with you, my family. Over the years, your voices have invited me to join your study groups or your serving teams, to dare to believe that I'm good enough, deeply loved, a vessel essential to part of God's plan in the lives that mine intersects with. Your different voices have encouraged and affirmed me and have uplifted me in prayer. I'm grateful for your voices that have taught me who and how God is, how to extend grace or serve lovingly and selflessly, how to speak new life into situations, how to pray and trust, how to look at things with new eyes. Your different voices continue to encourage me to love in new ways, to let go of me and learn the joy of giving, and most of all, the different voices that have pointed me to the truth that Jesus came to share and to show me, that the most important word, the most powerful word in life is thank you. We are told over and over again in scripture to give thanks, and Jesus did it before he did anything. Now, um, I used to think when I was younger that God was demanding me to say thank you for everything that he gave, whether I was happy or I wasn't. And now I've come to realize he's not demanding a thing. He's been trying to lovingly tell me that if we spent our time looking for the big and the small things to say thank you for in life, we would come to realize that all of life is gift. And you know, in order to receive gift, you have to realize that someone has been giving it to you. Someone that thought lovingly enough of us to want to give it. He's trying to communicate to me, to us, that a life that looks for reasons to thank and then spends that lifetime communicating their thanks will be a life that knows joy and purpose and fullness in life. And in doing so, we gift those same things to the people around us. I choose to live out my thank you here by serving, reading, singing, helping with events, by taking time to acknowledge people that are here, to affirm and encourage them, to pray for and about my family here. But I don't leave it here. I choose to dare to carry my thanks living into my workplace and my life outside of here, where I deliberately look for opportunities to speak affirmation, encouragement, caring, and thanks for the short and the tall people that God has blessed me in. It, I do it by the ways that I say things out loud, the ways that I treat them, the notes that I leave. I realize now that a gift never stops being a gift, as Ann Voskamp would say. So Don and I share from the things that we've been given. We find ways to give of our time, of our things, of our meals, of our money to others that might be blessed in its giving. I have to admit to you that the greatest obstacle I work to overcome in all of my giving is fear. Is there going to be enough left for me? God dares me to try him, to see. And so far, each time that I find that I have opened up to let go, 
my life finds itself open to receive other gifts that he has been waiting for me to get. And so far, I can look you in the eye and tell you, I've always had more than enough. Something tells me that will continue. So I feel blessed today to look at all of you and tell you, thank you, each one of you, for the gift that you are and for the voices that you have spoken into my life. I am so glad you gave the gift of those, and I can't help but wait to, or I can't help but want to pass that same gift on so that your gift given to me continues to be gift. Thank you. of all who trust in you. Without you, nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Embrace us with your mercy, 
that with you as our ruler and guide, we may live through what is temporary without losing what is eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
the water and the Holy Spirit. You give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Callie with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Callie Jean, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. welcome this newly baptized one. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. We have a gift for her this morning made by the women. It's a quilt. Let's put that with you. And you know what? I think probably people are just really wanting to salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He's become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say on that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done glory. Let this be known. 
Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there, he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called of one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted, fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and begged, began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Jesus teaches in parables, for it allows us to decode a story and interpret what it means for us, each of us individually and as a whole as God's beloved children. Reading the living word of God, searching for truth and answers, invites the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. Part of parenting is allowing children to figure things out on their own no matter how difficult of a struggle that child may have. As a parent, I confess that is easier said than done. But that's what God does for each of us. We are free to make our own choices. We may seek our parents' advice, and we might look at others for advice and learn from the examples and experiences of others. But ultimately, we are responsible for our own actions and our words and of course we also are responsible for the consequences our parable today the well-known prodigal son appears to contain a simple and straightforward message we have a father who's rejoicing when his selfish son returns home in desperate need of care and compassion and love likely and we have a brother who's angry and bitter and jealous, not only of the attention that this drifter brother receives, but also because he's not receiving that attention either for being the good child. The prodigal son is a story perhaps of sibling rivalry, perhaps parental favoritism, 
but it's a story with a happy ending. These are all fine observations about the story, but I think that we need to look back and see why Jesus is even telling this parable in the first place. We see prior to this in scripture that Jesus shares two other parables, the parable of the woman with the lost coins, to which is no fault of her own, and the parable of the lost sheep, where one little lost sheep is being searched for, and rejoicing occurs when it is found. Jesus shares these parables, or little stories, to teach us a lesson, a lesson that is both individual and for us as a whole, as God's children. So why is Jesus using this parable? Well, if we look back, we will see that Jesus was receiving some great slack. He was facing some angry and bitter and perhaps jealous Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees, they took the Jewish law seriously. And perhaps they even used those Old Testament laws to their advantage at times where they purposely avoided people, certain people, people that were unclean. And they used the law as an excuse to ignore those in need. While the purity laws and observance of cleanliness would have been important during this time period, Jesus did not shun from the persons who would have been labeled unclean. Instead, he did the exact opposite, he purposely spent time with them. Widows and lepers, diseased persons, poor people, sinners, all outcasts in the society of Jesus' time. The Pharisees grumbled, and they said, This man sits with sinners, and he eats with them. And Jesus' reply is these three parables. I am amazed. Jesus is fully human, yet he gives a divine response as we read, remember his divinity. He didn't argue with the Pharisees. He didn't get mad. He didn't say, who do you think I am? I'm the son of God. I can eat with whoever I want to eat with. You can't tell me who to hang out with. He didn't go back to dining with the outcasts and gossip about the Pharisees. Instead, I wish I could do something like that. I wish I had a library of parables in my head so that when I felt like I needed to defend myself or defend another person, I could just come up with a good story to tell instead of defending myself. What if we had these little libraries of parables? But the more I think about that, perhaps we do. What if we let Jesus be the main character that we might share with someone, using him as our example. So Jesus has a lesson for us to learn. As we hear the gospel text today, the Holy Spirit intercedes to guide our thoughts as we ponder what this might mean for each of us. I know when I read scripture, I always feel invited to put myself right into the story as one of the characters. So today I encourage each of us to do the same. Can you recall a point in your lives thus far where you may have been in a similar position as one in our story today? Have you been a parent who's faced a child's selfish acts? Or have you been a parent whose child has wandered off far from the ways in which that they were raised? Have you been a parent hoping and praying for your beloved one's return? Have you been in a position where you've caught yourself in selfishness, seeking your own way, living in a world of entitlement? Can you relate to the sibling relationship in this story? Have you ever been angry or bitter or jealous of a brother or a sister? talking beyond siblings by birth. Keep in mind that we have many brothers and sisters in this world, outside of the walls of our own homes, outside of the walls of our church, 
outside of the walls of our community and even the walls of our own country? Have we disagreed with someone's choices and we now harbor judgment, bitterness, hatred, jealousy, or resentment for a special person or a group of persons? Perhaps you can relate with the narrator in this story, Jesus, seeing a situation as an outsider looking in. You want to help, and it's so easy to see what needs to be said or done to repair what is broken. If only those involved could step back and see the bigger picture. I don't know about you, but I'm willing to confess that I have found myself as each character in this story at times in my life. I've been the parent concerned about my child. I've been the sibling angry and jealous and bitter. I've been the narrator looking on the outside wanting to do something but needing to patiently wait. And if I had to guess, each of us might be feeling a bit uneasy right now because I know I do. Because we might be seeing a face at this moment or faces. Perhaps we see ourselves standing in a mirror. We see our own hurt, our own disappointment, our anger, our fear, our bitterness. But we don't want to feel this way. We don't want to admit that we've been broken. We need to put on a happy face. I mean, we are Christians. God gives us the strength to do so, right? God gives us the strength to put on our happy face every day. I want you to remember that God is like the Father in this parable. God is ready to clothe us with the finest robe, ready to bring in the fatted calf, ready to throw a big party and celebration for our return home, our return home when we reconcile with God and with one another. One of my seminary professors you will have the pleasure of meeting in February, spoke a very bold statement that's been brewing in my mind for some time now, a couple of months. Professor Prasad said, whenever we look at another person with judgmental eyes or heart, we deny the deity of God. Whenever we look at another person with judgmental eyes, or heart, we deny the deity of God. In my months of pondering this statement, I've come to paint a picture. I realize that if I look at another person and I'm judging them, I'm looking straight at Jesus and I'm denying him. And that just hurts. But thankfully, church today for worship, to witness a baptism. We've come for fellowship. We've come to confess our sin. We've come to receive forgiveness. We've come to be reconciled with Christ, and perhaps for other reasons. But we remain unreconciled with Christ if we are harboring ill will towards another. In our baptisms, we receive the Holy Spirit, so God resides in each one of us. We as humans are not made for sin, but we are made for reconciliation. We are made in God's image. We are made not to divide and deny each other, but we are to love one another because God first loved us. Where have you heard that, Team Ohio? We love because God first loved us. In doing so, we are living out God's grace. The heart of our Lutheran beliefs is that we are saved by grace through faith. Our stewardship theme this season 
is first we give of ourselves, giving in grace. It's a pretty bold statement. For what we give of ourselves is beyond, is beyond our time or talents and financial resources. It's God that lives in us that we give. It's by God's grace that we are able to do so. Apart from God, where does our strength come? I don't know about you, but I get very tired and grumbly, and I feel very lost when I try to do things on my own. The prideful high of being able to pat myself on the back on occasion is pretty short-lived when I become bereaved and have that ill will feeling of self-righteousness. So if you're feeling lost, if you've wandered, you're broken and weak inside, if you're using every ounce of energy to present wholeness on the outside, if you're holding a grudge, if you're feeling unloved, I ask you, what character in the parable do you resonate with right now? Forgiveness is for everyone. Confessing our sin, our unnecessary judgments, so freeing. And I understand that brokenness and discord in certain situations are usually two-sided. However, from my own experience, I encourage you to not let fear of rejection paralyze you from making a move. God calls us to unity with all people despite our differences. In doing so, we no longer risk denying the one who died so that we might live. My friends, it's never too late to return home. As the father patiently waited for the return of his son, God patiently waits for us to return to God's loving, outstretched arms, ready to embrace us, Braces in the arms of our Maker, where pain and sorrow and hatred and disappointment will be exchanged for peace, joy, wholeness, love, and hope. Even on the best of my days, I still need that embrace, that unconditional love and acceptance that comes only in the forgiveness and grace that we receive through Jesus Christ. God is waiting, my brothers and sisters. Don't be afraid to return home.
the people of God gathered here and throughout the world, we offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. For the church, the missionaries and teachers, clergy and laity, and all ministers who proclaim the gospel in word and deed, including Bishop Eaton and Bishop Clements, the light of Christ enlighten the whole earth. Let us pray. For rivers and lakes, hills and mountains, fruit and vegetables, and animals great and small, that creation thrive and that we care for all God has given us. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For all in authority at the local, state, national, and international levels, for those who advocate for equity and for relief workers and their supporters, let us pray. Have mercy. For those who hunger or thirst, for those who doubt or are terrified, for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, including those we name in our hearts, that all ex experience the healing and comfort given through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For those who mourn, including the family of Luann Peasley Schmidt, let us pray. Have mercy. For those who gathered in this place to hear the gospel and receive the good gifts of God through Christ Jesus, that guided by the Holy Spirit, we serve our neighbors who are in need, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the men and women who served and defended our country and values of freedom and justice we hold so dear, that we may never take for granted the privileges they have secured for us, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for the saints of every time and place who have died in Christ, and that we follow their example of faithful living, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Almighty God, you have promised to hear those who call upon your name. We commend all our spoken and silent prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I had mine, uh, I had mine yesterday. Hmm? No, no, we had the whole thing yesterday.
merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory, through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. To you, O God, Father and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Our Father,
and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We come again to you, O God, giving you thanks that in this feast of mercy you have embraced us and healed us, making us one in the body of Christ. Go with us on our way. Equip us with for every good work that we may continue to give you thanks by embracing others with mercy and healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace.